Islam is partly because everything is prefaced with the name of God a big religion it seeks to interfere with or transform every aspect of the human condition the human experience mind body and soul in this lecture I'll be talking about the easiest aspect of that namely the actual nuts and bolts of the religion what Muslims do why they do it uh, I'll be addressing in a later lecture but before I get into scratching the surface of this huge subject of the practice of the religion which doesn't of course just entail forms of worship but also means family life issues of law even state and government I want to rehearse with you one or two issues that could perhaps be useful in a classroom situation when you're attempting to inject a certain energy into possibly apathetic or recalcitrant pupils namely why is Islam worth knowing about at all hmm? after all I remember suppressing yawns of boredom when I did classics at school although we were earnestly told that it was important and I was never quite persuaded by the, the reasons but in the case of Islam actually the case is a lot easier to make for a number of reasons many of which you've probably hit on yourselves which is why you decided to take two weeks out of your busy lives to to be with us this summer let me just try and list them for you firstly the obvious world historical reason why we need to know about Islam for those of us who are of Western European patrimony Islam engaged more profoundly with the West than did any other civilization by several orders of magnitude because it was the dominant civilization of the pre-modern world we can say that say from the 8th century until maybe the 16th century it was the most successful the biggest the most prosperous the most militarily powerful civilization on the planet Europe was confined to the geographically pretty small appendage to the old world that is Europe that was Western Europe and Christendom and slowly expanding to the east but Islam sprawled over several continents from what is now Senegal across to Java and whichever way you went if you were a medieval European sooner or later usually sooner you would bump into Islam so it has shaped our patrimony as Europeans more profoundly than has anybody else's patrimony through this historical geographical accident if you like for that reason alone it's hugely important we need to understand it it's also significant because not only did it impinge on the uh, economic and military and political experience of our ancestors but also because more than any other religion it is close to the historic religion of um, Western Christendom Christianity although nowadays it's being constructed by some politicians and certainly by the mass media as the paradigmatic other that force that is really at the opposite pole of everything we know and hold dear in the West the fact is that it is the closest of all the world's religions to Christianity barring none not even barring Judaism why because the central figure of Christian faith Jesus of Nazareth a blessed memory is commemorated explicitly in the Muslim scripture not commemorated explicitly in any other non-christian scripture Islam like Christianity grows out of the same Near Eastern Semitic soil and is formulated historically in terms of the same Greek intellectual patrimony it's pretty close despite our hasty judgment of it quite often as being something that's way out there and historically it has shaped the West as I'll be addressing in a lecture next week uh, there has been a long period of mutual fecundation between Islam and Christendom that does not find uh, any comparison or any rival in the story of any other inter-civilizational transaction and in our age of globalization multiculturalism it's interesting to see um, how what we take to be modern problems actually uh, have, have medieval roots and can often by pre-modern societies be quite successfully and ambitiously resolved third issue Islam is not just important to historians but it's important to us today in the modern world because of the undeniable fact that Islam is not just an ancient civilization but it is alive and kicking the majority religion of maybe 55 countries in the world and also a significant minority present now in just about every other country in the world 
And to look at this from the demographic point of view, and demography, population growth, is one of the big forces in the shaping of world history. It's a striking fact that at the beginning of the 20th century, it's reckoned that about 12 to 13 percent of the world's population was Muslim. Now the figure is about 20 percent, which is a massive growth, not primarily through conversion, but overwhelmingly through the fact that the Muslim uh, population is located in poor third world countries with high rates of natural increase. And that process is continuing so that it is calculated quite reliably that by the year 2030, Islam will now have more followers than any other religion on the planet. It will be about 30% of the world's population, after which the curve starts to level out. And that has enormous implications for the world, uh, not just uh, on third world cultures rapidly urbanizing with huge urban poor communities that frequently find themselves underemployed, frustrated, despised, alienated, and can... Uh, uh, find solace in forms of religious extremism. But also in terms of the transformation that's taking place in our own religious landscape here in the West. Uh, Islam is now the second religion of just about every Western country that I can think of. In England, there are six times as many Muslims as there are Jewish people now. In Brussels, the symbolic capital of the European Union, a majority of babies born two years ago, that's the most recent statistic I've seen, are actually Muslims. Uh, in the symbolic capital of Western Christendom, the city of Rome, the most common name for a baby is now not Paolo or Giovanni, but is Muhammad. And this itself is triggering a number of backlash phenomena which are going to be hitting our headlines increasingly over the next few decades. Another reason why we really need to know about Islam as citizens of the world, even if we have no theological proclivities of our own. Take, for instance, the fact that 20% of the population of a civilised country like France now votes routinely for a neo-fascist party, which has in its election manifesto the commitment to deport every person naturalised in France since 1973 unless they can demonstrate that they have what they call a European patrimony, which basically means a white face. Um, the recent municipal elections in Antwerp, the second city of Belgium, saw the victory of a party called the Vlamsblok, which is a neo-fascist Flemish nationalist party um, that has called in its manifesto for the prohibition of the practice of Islam in Belgium. And analyst after analyst has pointed out that where previously the lightning rod for Europe's prejudices and insecurities was Jewish minorities, now uh, it is the Muslims who have stepped into their shoes. I've seen the election poster for the Blamps block, uh, which shows a kind of before and after cartoon, before and after the hoped for far-right victory. And in the before image, you get a uh, miserable looking inner city street with a tumble-down mosque in a corner, and there's a non-white, apparently Arab, perhaps North African youth, shooting heroin in the corner, and somebody is being mugged. And in the after image, the mosque has been re replaced by a church with a big cross, and a blonde youth is helping a little old lady across the road. It's quite explicit. Uh, and it is increasingly the face of the new Europe, of new European politics. This, whether we like it or not, is informing the big debates that we're now having at the moment in Europe about asylum seekers, refugees, um, the collapsing demography of the indigenous European populations, and so on. This is going to be one of the big political teasers for the West in years to come. So that's another reason why we need to know about Islam. Are these newcomers irreducibly alien, foreign, cannot be assimilated to our civilization? In fact, as I've indicated, Islam is actually closer to the traditional civilization of the West than the civilization of any other major um, historic culture. Now, in the United States, this debate has, again, as you'll probably know better than I, become sharp in the form of the clash of civilizations argument. Harvard academic, um, what's his name, Huntingdon, has produced uh, a book called The Clash of Civilizations, a bestseller, 
in which he says that with the decline of the old polarisation between ideologies, capitalism in the West, communism in the East, we are seeing a regression or perhaps a recrudescence of much older uh, and more primordial human divisions, that it is cultural plates. He uses this geological image of clashing plate tectonic uh, uh, theory to account for what he takes to be the shape of conflict in today's world. And he says that the world of Islam, because it's so categorically different to the West, because it's theocratic, because it has no democratic traditions, etc., etc., all the old essentializing stereotypes are wheeled out, uh, it has bloody borders, he says. Why is the Islamic world such a mess? All of these wars that we read in our headlines, well, it's because there's something irreconcilably uh, anarchic, dangerous, hostile to the West's project for global civilization. Now, that view has been very warmly received by a large number of right-wing journalists and politicians and has uh, triggered a whole string of learned seminars in right-wing think tanks in Washington and elsewhere. But amongst academics, it has been roundly rejected for a number of reasons, of which I'll just give you a few. I think it's important to dwell on them because this is really at the core of what this uh, program is trying to achieve. Firstly, that the actual evidence doesn't support Huntington's claim that the West is sweetness and light and the Islamic world is a kind of impossible crucible of ancient ethnic and religious prejudice. Take, for instance, his view that Islam has bloody borders. In fact, the number of conflicts between Muslim countries and non-Muslim neighbor countries is extremely small when compared to conflicts amongst Muslims themselves. On Huntington's view, the Islamic world is shaping up as a civilizational block, is uniting against others. But in fact, there is not the least sign of that. Muslim nations do not seem to be acting in significant solidarity with each other. Probably they should, but the reality is they're not. They had every excuse to intervene during the recent genocide in Bosnia, but in fact, they didn't. If you look at Iranian foreign policy, and Iran is on Huntington's view a kind of uh, the shape of things to come and uh, a source of a new global Islamic international. In fact, there is no coherent instance of Iran acting against its own narrow strategic interests and in favor of global Islamic interests. In uh, the recent conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, Azerbaijan, Shiite Muslim, Armenia, uh, Christian, the uh, Iranian government sided absolutely with the Armenians. The reason was, well, there was a pipeline that they wanted to drive through that part of the world, and it was um, expedient for them to take their side. In the current civil war in Tajikistan, you have an Islamist opposition against a more or less communist secular regime in Dushanbe, the capital. The Iranians are supporting the communist secular regime against the Islamists. So really, there's very little evidence to suggest that there is some convergence between Islamic countries and that there is an Islamic block of nations emerging. In fact, usually the conflicts are between Muslims themselves, not between the Islamic world and other worlds, whether it be the Confucian world, the European world, and these other essentialized civilizational categories that Huntington likes to play with. Another point that I think has to be made in terms of a very widespread stereotype in the West that Huntington is exploiting is the idea that the Islamic world is routinely less peaceful than its neighbors. In fact, if we take the civilization that Huntington and his allies like to view as the opposite pole of Islam, if you actually pull out an encyclopedia and spend 10 minutes totting up the casualty figures for the great conflicts of the century that just passed, you will see that European civilization has accounted for maybe 130 million violent deaths, and more if you attribute, say, Maoism to European civilization, which is a case that you can make. Stalin's purges, First and Second World War, all of these obvious cases, the Nazi Holocaust. It's a pretty grim figure for a civilization that Huntington likes to present as being the way the world should go. Uh, and of course, continuing in very recent conflicts in Bosnia, Chechenia, elsewhere, and possibly in Belgium, possibly in France, if the far right reaches a critical mass, if the immigrants continue to come, who knows? God forbid. But the Islamic world actually has not been responsible for any of the large, real, meat grinder wars of the 20th century. That's not to exonerate the Islamic world, 
I would be the last person to wish to do that. Nonetheless, it wasn't the Muslims who built Auschwitz. We often forget that uh, the safest place in the world, apart from the Anglo-Saxon world, for the Jewish people during the Second World War was actually the Islamic world. <coughs> Even those areas that were under Nazi occupation, like Algeria, kept their Jewish populations intact because there was not the groundswell of popular anti-Semitism that made the final solution popular, uh, possible in places like Croatia, Slovakia, the Ukraine, Poland, and elsewhere. It's a fact that we often tend to neglect. In fact, there has not been a significant conflict in the Middle East involving an aggression by a Muslim state against a non-Muslim state since, I would say, the 1670s, when the Ottomans invaded Poland. That's the last example that springs to mind, of a clear example of some kind of religiously motivated Islamic onslaught on a non-Muslim neighbour. Whereas if you look at what Europe has been up to in the previous 300 years, it's a, uh, a pretty shabby story. Now you can say that, well, Europe has now learned its lesson. I don't actually believe that. I think that we're now seeing the wheel turning full circle and that the far right is going to reach um, greater and greater positions of authority in many European countries in the next few years. Um, but anyway, that's just by way of not exonerating the Islamic world or saying that the terrorists, the extremists and, and the others that constantly hit our hedge, headlines are in some sense insignificant or trivial. But to put things in proportion, that we shouldn't throw stones uh, uh, when we ourselves live in such a, a palpably glass house. 